Welcome to season three of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human-centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. Sophia Diaz is a speaker, fashion designer, music artist, and chef, but she also has a significant insight on isolated partners who are brought into a foreign country and who experience domestic violence. Hers is a story of trauma, survival, and finding the light towards freedom. From Goa, India to Chicago, Illinois, Diaz has become a one-woman army who built a thriving career, which includes writing a book, producing a film and album, and creating a worldwide high-end fashion brand. She's an activist who supports numerous deprived, destitute, and homeless people across the globe. Please welcome Sophia Diaz. Thank you very much for having me, Debbie. It's such a pleasure being here. Thank you. Thank you. What was life like growing up for you in India? I grew up part of my life in India and then um, we lived um, across the globe. Life was very much uh, around Christianity. We were a very staunch Catholic family. So attending church, uh, mass, uh, you know, volunteering uh, wherever we could. Um, that was um, a part of growing up. And a part of growing up for me was also spending quite a lot of time in a country that I treasure very much. It's called, uh, it's in the Caribbean, Jamaica. And that was the result why I chose to record my very first album at Tough Gong in Jamaica. Cool. And young women don't usually have the skill set to see the signs and depending on their situation, they can be trapped before it's too late to flee. So how did you meet your partner? And did he bring you to America right away? Um, I met my former spouse whilst at a time when I lived and worked in China. So we met in China and then circumstances developed and we moved to America, to Chicago, where we had offices and businesses all across the United States. Did you know English at the beginning? Yes, I did speak English, uh, Portuguese, and a bit of Indian. So what was it like for you when you first came over? I mean, I had traveled to America extensively as a teenager and then as an adult for business. So I was very familiar with the American culture, the democracy, not so much the politics, but I was um, exposed to the American people. I was working for my former spouse. So how bad did it get? Just share what you're comfortable sharing. Well, I wrote a book about what I endured and what really transpired in the divorce courtroom. And I published my book, which is called Blondie Proof. It's on Amazon now. And in that, I talk deeply about the great injustice that I endured in that courtroom and at the hands of the former spouse, which was brutal, strategic, um, deliberate cruelty in every form that a human being could endure. And one of the biggest set Backs for me was that I did not have any family ties in America. So here, you know, primarily by myself, but what I did have was some very close friends, I call them allies, who came to my aid, and also people from that I'd worked and known from all across the world, from South Africa to England and Italy and you know, Switzerland and all of that. 
we talked before we came on the show here. Did you know of any of the rights that you might have had at that time as yeah. a woman? I did. Uh, I had a fantastic team of uh, divorce attorneys uh, who were very competent, but all of my rights were stripped off of me inside room 3010. The judge presiding in that room took my matter in the sense, uh, blatantly and plainly speaking in English, that I had zero rights, that everything that I had worked for within the marriage belonged to the former spouse. I had zero rights. I did not even have the right to write, to take notes about the matter in, in the courtroom. The judge inside room 3010 would yell, scream, shout, berate, insult, and humiliate me in the presence of mine attorneys. And on one instance, she even suggested, Miss Diaz, I will make the decision where you live and how you live. That was, I think, every legal and moral twist in the legal uh, world was violated in my case. And I really would like for the world, for the people of America to really know and understand what happened inside room 3010, just so that it never happens to anybody else. What happened to me should never happen to any other person, irrespective of gender, race, or color. Wow. And your lawyers are right there, and they... Yeah, my attorneys were right there, and, you know, we would talk after these meetings with the judge and they just shook their head and they said well Sophia I believe that the power of being a judge has gone to the judge's head and she believes that she's God well sadly that's true for some other ones as well so how did you find your way out of this did he file you file and how did you find your way to freedom, really? Um, you know, uh, Bulletproof does not define me. I have written um, a second book called Bulletproof and an album by the same name, Bulletproof. Um, I filed uh, a petition for divorce uh, twice um, at a time when we were making millions of dollars. I mean, the company was going to go to IPO around that time and my former spouse had married a second wife. He'd taken a second wife in China. Um, funnily, I know the person and I just did not want to be in a horrible marriage. I had no investment accounts, no savings accounts, no checking account, no credit card. I was not even allowed to purchase groceries for myself. And my pet, my, I had a large Bernese mountain dog then, Mr. Santos. God bless him, he's passed on now. And three adopted cats. But despite the fact that I've vocally talked about it, I've written about it. I've written a song in Bulletproof album called Room 3010, where I really depict, I believe that sharing is empowering. I share my, my pain as I would say, with the world, with the people of the world. But that the past does not define me. That door has been shut and it will forever be shut. I really do not know why my, the former spouse would treat me with such cruelty and gather up a big gang to really destroy my life, but their plan failed. I survived with the help of tremendously powerful friends, allies, former colleagues from all over the world who gave me work. I needed to work and you know, I would work day and night and night and day and sustain myself and others invested in my businesses. 
small businesses, it takes a lot of time to recover when one day you go to bed, you know, being a self-made multimillionaire that you've worked hard all your life. And the next morning you wake up and you have $20 in your bank account. That's quite a shock to the system. And I had to grow up very quickly overnight. There were two ways I could have gone. I could have spiraled into sadness and depression and say, oh me, I'm a victim. Or it was waking up the next morning, saying a prayer, Psalm 23, which I live by, and say, dear God, just show me what the next steps are and how can I get out of this as soon as possible. And that took about four and a half years of being constantly tortured and tormented inside room 3010. But it took a lot of courage, a tremendous amount of courage, discipline, you know, eating right, sleeping right, and making those phone calls, those phone calls to all those hundreds of people I knew in the past, just asking them for jobs, for work. Wow. Just have to say, you mentioned Psalm 23. That was my guiding light. (laughs) How crazy is that? I wonder how many other people who have been in domestic situations that were so toxic. I wonder how many others went to that psalm for comfort as well. (laughs) Wow. In 2020, I wrote a song, Psalm 23, um, Psalm 23. Uh, I took the psalm, retained the title and changed the the wordings and wrote my own lyrics. I wrote the song for a very brave and a courageous lady called Nazneen Ratcliffe, who was detained in Iran under some horrific conditions. And, you know, she was just such an inspiration to me. And she's a dual citizen of Great Britain and Iran. I'm a dual citizen of Great Britain and the US. And I actually, recorded that single at Tough Gong and it was produced by veteran music producer Mr. Clive Hunt. I was really blessed and lucky to have had the opportunity to work with him. Wow. So we do hear so much about insul and misogynistic men who seek out these young brides from other countries and There's been crime shows and movies about these catalogs that they choose from and the dangerous situations these women find themselves in. How prevalent do you think this is? And how are these women conned in their own countries? Um, For me, it was when my former spouse took a second wife in China. The second wife worked for our company. She was a part of the company, a very young girl. I think she was about 23 years old. But the tragic and the tragedy in my situation was, despite the fact that I did ask for a divorce from the former spouse, he disagreed. But what was very prevalent and his strategy was simply to kill me, to have me killed. So there was an attempt on a cruise in Mozambique, and I write about it this in detail in the book where I was taken to a remote part of the jungle on the pretext of taking a fantastic photograph and I was asked to march off the cliff. Luckily some tour guide came with a bunch of tourists and stopped that from happening and you know essentially Debbie I was really left to die. My Mm -hmm. only option at that point in Chicago in my former marital home was The only option I had was to die. I had no money, no access to any of my earnings. And with all the businesses that I had given to United Airlines, I'm a big fan of United Airlines. I had a few million miles in my account, which I could have purchased a ticket to fly, to have face-to-face meetings with friends and England, in London, in New York, in Italy, wherever. But all of my airline miles were wiped out. Oh, wow. So I was trapped in hell. 
and I really emphasize a living hell strategically strategized by the person closest to me, the man I was married to. Mm -hmm. So I have to emphasize that it was incredibly dangerous, the position that I was put in. Yeah, and you don't psychologically, see psychologically, emotionally, financially. I mean, nobody even knew that I existed. Nobody, if had I died or been murdered, nobody would have known where I was had I not asked for help. And I still emphasize when I do talk to women and people that it takes a great amount of courage to ask for help. But that is so very important. People in dire situations have to have the courage to ask for help. Yeah. There are so many people out there just wanting to help. Yeah. And a lot of these guys, they hold the passports and identifying documents also hostage. So they have no privacy or freedom at home. And even if they're out in the world, they, they're monitored. So how do, when they're in a situation where you're so isolated and every move is monitored, how can you find that person? How can you ask for help? How, where, like, who would you ask? Who would you trust? <laughs> Like trust was really important, but, you know, um, in situations like this, I had two choices. One was to be suspicious, nervous, paranoid, and have no trust. But I chose to be who I was before I met the former spouse. I chose to be myself. I'm a very loving, trusting, giving, caring, intelligent human being that my liberty was taken away in, in such a way, Debbie, that uh, the camera, the security system in my home was monitored. So he knew my comings and goings and the group of people that I describe in the book. There were 10 of them. They made my life hell. My BMW car, it had a tracker on it. My phone calls, my emails, my text messages, including WhatsApp messages were monitored. So they knew my every movement, my dentist appointment, what time I went to the gym and at what time I took my dog out for a walk. It was harrowing. It, it truly was harrowing. It is, it is a miracle that I survived. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, even having the courage to file for divorce is a big thing. Yes. I don't think a lot of women that are in a situation have that courage or they don't garner that courage until he threatens the children or, or I don't know, sometimes you, you finally reach that moment, but and hope it's not too late. It's a big ask, but how do we find a way to have women find a way to protect themselves how do we i guess it depends on each country and and what access to education they have but how do we find a way to protect them from getting themselves into these situations i mean sometimes it's unavoidable i know that there are some cultures where you have pre-arranged marriage i had a woman on this show who was in a pre-arranged marriage and she saw it through until later on in life when she got it finally got her divorce but is there a way that we can protect women and girls before they get to this point I know I was just as naive you don't know anything when you're when you're 20 <laughs> right I mean I would say that um, education is the answer education from a very early age uh, I've been in countries like Mozambique Tanzania South Africa Kenya where I have been volunteering with young girls, teenage girls, for very many years. But um, we are so privileged right now in, in America. I was just at the House of the Good Shepherd just last Saturday. Um, I'm on the women's board, Catholic Charities, Illinois. 
It's a shelter for destitute mothers and survivors of domestic abuse and young children. And I had the privilege to serve them. We cooked a beautiful harvest fall dinner. And Father Brian was there, who says the mass there every Friday. And I highlighted the importance of uh, being educated and also knowing about their rights. What happened in room 3010 will be a dark slap in the face for the American democratic system, the judicial system. And I believe in the American judicial system. It's a fair system for all. But I was the chosen one to have zero rights inside room 3010. How long did it take you to find yourself? after? It was a day-to-day -day conversation with myself and God and a close connection to Psalm 23 to find myself. But in the midst of all that hell and horror, I wrote a fantastic album. I'm very proud of myself for writing that. It's a seven-track album called Bulletproof. The title is I Survived. I, what felt like I was put before a firing squad in, in the comfort of my own home and then being fired from every angle by the divorce judge inside 3010. And I would say finding myself, finding the back, the Sophia Diaz was a day-to-day -day exercise. Um, it, it has everything to do from the body to the mind to the spirit and the soul. I'm a runner, so I would run four kilometers every other day. And then on a good day, I would run 12 kilometers. And running is very liberating for me. And I continued cooking gourmet meals for the homeless that live, still reside at Tent City on the corner of Roosevelt and Canal Street. I had a good team of people who would come and congregate at my home in my kitchen and we would cook fantastic meals and drive there and sit down and talk to the residents. They have very little. They live in tents. So they're there in the rain and the sun, in the wind, in the snow. So it's a very challenging place for them. Mm. Yeah, street life can't be easy. So what was that moment when you knew you got this, you finally got it and you survived, you found your own voice? Was it when you wrote the album? Was it after that? Was it a combination of all of it? It was a combination of all of it and it really felt good that at last the album got a lot of support from some of the most sought after musicians in the world. I worked with Grammy award winning music engineer called Shane Brown on the album, Clive Hunt, and some sought after musicians, Kirk Benet, Dean Frazier, who's an angel on, this, on saxophone, Hector Lewis. I worked with four music engineers on the album. So I had a music engineer in New York, and three in Kingston, Jamaica, and everybody worked really hard, tirelessly you know, to make it um, successful. I got distributed in 22 countries, and I'm in on every digital platform, and including YouTube and Vivo, and that was very liberating. So a musician isn't your only thing, and cooking, it's also fashion designing. <laughs> so... Where did this fit in? Did that start at the beginning or were you always doing that? And wow, you've taken that pretty far too. My mother was a seamstress. So the passion and the fascination with going and putting clothes together came from a very early age. In 2013, I launched a small company called DS Designs in Milan, Italy. I designed futuristic sunglasses, eyewear. And that led on to another clothing line called Flow by Diaz. And in between designing clothes and whatever else for friends and colleagues. So the one thing about going through what you did 
you might tend to vet your future partners, employees, and, and business partners a lot better. Do you find your radar goes up a lot? <laughs> no, not really. Uh, that's a closed door now. And the real Sophia is back with no suspicions and no mistrust. I take everybody by face value. And it's the only way for me to live my life really and i'm really excited i'm working on my second album called bulletproof uh, legacy which is after the war um uh, life and i'm leaving a legacy with the second album right on mm-hmm. yeah and also when you're working with people or when you're surrounding yourself with people you seem to find when you're in a better mental state as well you seem to attract better people as well so absolutely can't emphasize enough working on that inner psyche on that if it means finding a therapist or doing whatever you need to get that help right well debbie i mean i could not agree with you i've never seen a therapist my therapists were my three black cats and my one large (laughs) Bernese mountain dog whom I love and adore, and they've lived with me all over the world. They lived with me in China, and they're here right now. Uh, One, Mr. Sola, sadly passed away. But the importance, as you just said, of surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than me, more intelligent than I am, and just dynamic um, is the key, really, for everything. And I've always surrounded myself and I take great pride in working with some of the finest people in the industries. For example, my last three collections were made in Bursa, B-U-R-S-A in Turkey. A lot of people have not heard of that, but I've had connections in Bursa in the factories where my collections are made for very many years, for about 22 years. And I tend to work with the same people and they are the finest clothiers in the world. Mm -hmm. If there's anybody out there who is interested in launching a clothing line, I would highly recommend Turkey in Bursa. Having good quality people makes all the difference. Yes. No doubt there's clarity and everybody works as a team. There's no who's the boss and there's no whining and (laughs) I I can't deal with low vibrational people. I'm truly blessed. And also with uh, the second album, I'm working with some of the finest musicians from Neptune Studios, North Carolina. They have the highest technology currently. And I'm also working with the same team from Kingston. Mm. If someone is watching or listening to this, who's in a desperate situation, what can you tell them to give them hope? What tools do they need to find their freedom? I would say, in all honesty, it's very simple. I would say, ask for help, but ask for help from the right people. And please do not be disappointed if one or two people don't return your calls or don't help you because that happened to me too. But keep asking for help because there are people out there who would want to help you with no strings attached. And if it makes you feel any better, the people that were closest to me in my tight knit circle people who came to my home, ate my food, drank my wine, when they knew that I was suffering and I was abandoned and literally left to die, uh, none of them bothered to ring me. So, you know, that's the point in your life when you determine who your friends are and who you can trust. Well said. Thank you so much, Sophia, for agreeing to come on the show it was wonderful thank you Debbie thank you so very much for having me I hope that you would stop by and uh, watch us record our second album in the studio it'll be fun oh I would love that (laughs) Chicago's on my bucket list by the way (laughs) absolutely 
You're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.